transition <laughs> yeah. so uh, apologies to all of the serious people who come after me because I just said number one Tom asked me this at the last second so I don't know how this is going to go ladies and gentlemen of the class of 24 use OEPs if I could offer you only one tip for the future of education open educational practices would be it the long-term benefits of OEPs have been proved by researchers and educators worldwide, whereas the rest of my advice is no advice more reliable than my own meandering experience. I will dispense this advice now. Now. Enjoy the power and beauty of co-creating your students. You will not understand the value that the youthful naivete energy will bring into its fate, but trust me, in 20 years you'll look back at student work and recall in a way that you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you both and how fabulous it really was to see open creation new knowledge happening right before your eyes. Your individual knowledge is not as great as you imagine. Don't worry about the future, or worry, but know that worrying is as effective as trying to solve the problem of equitable access to education when it's true longer. The real troubles in your life are apt to be things like AI, pandemics, that never crossed your worry line, the kind that blindsides you at 5 p.m. on some vital Wednesday at a conference in Corbin. Do one thing every day that scares you, like a gas. Don't be reckless with other people's OERs. Don't put up with people who are reckless with yours. Floss. <laughs> Don't waste your time on impact factors. Sometimes your OERs will be a hit, sometimes they won't. Their value should not be measured solely in page visits. Remember the stories of changing lives through access. Forget the insults of those who think open is less than. If you succeed in doing this, tell me how. Keep your written workshop feedback, throw away the light of scale happy grams, and share whatever you can. But don't feel guilty if you don't share everything to see by. The most interesting OERs I know had to be shared with caution and care. Some of the most interesting projects I have still don't know what CC license to use. Get plenty of rest. Be kind to your eyes. You'll miss them when they don't work so well anymore. Maybe you'll get tenure, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll get grants, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll leave academia at the age of 45 for a job that actually feels meaningful. Maybe you'll be answer from the chicken on your 50th work anniversary. Whatever you do, don't congratulate yourself too much or break yourself either. Your choices come from what you know at the time, so do everybody else's. Use your mind and privilege. Use it every way you can. Don't be afraid of what other people think of it, but use it wisely. Is the greatest instrument that academics have to make the world a place. Create something, even if only for a few minutes a day, and share. Know the rules and policies, even if you don't follow them. Do not read conservative media, it will only make you feel ugly. Get to know your senior leadership, you never know when they might be useful. Be nice to your students. They're your best link to the future, and the people most likely keep you grounded in the here and now. Understand that OER repositories come and go, as do standards. Maintain them both with care. Use OEP to bridge the gaps in access and equity. The older you get, the more you realize what you could have done when you were young and fearless. Live in Windsor once, but leave before it makes you hard. Live in Cork once, but leave before it makes you soft. Travel. Accept certain inalienable truths. Textbook costs will rise. Political support for open will wax and wane. You too will get old. And when you do, you'll fantasize that when you were young, textbooks were affordable, politicians supported the public good, and students respected their elders. 
respect elders, but mostly take great care with the knowledge they choose to share. Don't expect anyone else to support your passion for openness. Maybe you'll have a supportive vice chancellor, maybe you'll have a wealthy donor, but you never know when either one might disappear. Don't mess too much with version control, just clone that press book, revise, remix and redistribute it. Be careful of consultants whose advice your university buys, but be patient with those who share knowledge freely. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of dragging bits of lived knowledge from the garbage bin of life, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts and recycling it for more than it's worth. But trust me on the OEPs. A tree, a car, a cooing stug. That was all right. Now, actually, as I always say, like, now some people have, have been down this road before, and as I said, anybody can be a presenter, but these people are going to be gusseteers. They'll get presented with a badge, and if you're from North America, it's a coaster. If you're from this side, it's just a beer mat. But it's designed by the indomitable and hugely talented Brian Matters. So, fabulous. Our next, our next speaker is Emma Beetson. Her first presentation, first time big academic conference. Laurie asked me to go nice on her. I said, <laughs> of course, said, no, I'll go even worse. So instead of, have you prepared for five minutes, Emma? I have, yeah. yeah. Set the timer for four. <laughs> no, please don't, please don't do that. <laughs> Harsh, but I think ultimately I fair. It'll be character building for you. <laughs> I'm already feeling terrible to have music for you. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Are you ready? I absolutely Okay, yeah. so we get the hands up. No, you no, no, you threw down the gauntlet. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> get the hands up. Now, so I just start off easy. So we're going to start off on the hand on the left. You ready? A hand. That's a <laughs> pity full. Right. I tell you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even, I'm going to knock off the mic here. No, I'm just going to hold the mic here for a second. I want them to, I want the volume, fill the volume. A hay, a dough, a tree, a car, a cooey, gusta. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Beetson and I work for JISC in the UK. And um, today I'm here to talk to you about this, that new models of education are emerging and they're disrupting traditions and they're delivering the student experience differently. And I want to ask this question about it. For open education, do these new models present opportunity or threat? Spoiler right from the start that I'm not even going to attempt to answer that question. I don't really have a strong opinion. Rather, I'm putting it forward because I want to hear what you've got to say. I'll start by telling you a little bit about um, the project that, that drove this work. So we, we had a desk research project into new and emerging trends in education. Um, I fear you probably can't see this image very well. It's a screen grab from a Miro that we used that um, we used to map our findings for the research. Um, so we were researching these new trends and we identified a load of challenger or disruptor institutions that were doing things a bit differently. And then we became a bit interested in what was driving them into existence, what was happening socially, environmentally, economically, technologically, to kind of push them, nudge them forward and encourage them and what might happen and embed them even further. And it's these trend drivers that really dominated our work on the project. Um, we had a huge amount of information, so we grouped them into the six themes that you can see there, and there's kind of intersection between them. And we really hoped that our research about these drivers of change would be useful to educators who are considering future-proofing. There's a massive amount of issues to consider, um, and we wanted to make the task more manageable, um, give a kind of heads up about what might be coming down the line um, and help institutions to identify the opportunities in it. So we created a workshop that's based around 100 challenges or sort of mini scenarios of things that could happen in the future and they're organised into our six themes. And participants in the workshop get a chance to think about how they could react to and prepare for some of the challenges, and, and then they go on to imagine their future institution that's kind of embraced those challenges. We've had over 750 people use the resources over the last half a year, which is really great. It's actually not the thing that I want to, to talk to you about. What I want to talk about is this, is that it seems that the disruptor institutions seem to be leading the way forwards. 
when we did the workshops, we didn't present any of the trends that we'd been looking into. We didn't talk about any of the disruptive institutions. And yet the participants in the workshops, Imagine Futures, tend to be things that were based on models that the disruptive institutions were already doing. And I don't say that critically or negatively. I think it's potentially good. It means there's consensus about a way forward. But for me, it means that we should take notice of um, the disruptive institutions and what it is that they're doing. So let's do that. So here they are, or at least some of them. It's not an exhaustive set of examples. And there might be some that you recognize here. Um, others maybe not. I'm calling them disruptive institutions. It's a convenient term. They might not describe themselves as that. Um, you might not describe, themself, describe them as that. But what they are is institutions from all over the world who are moving away from traditions and they, they've got new models of mission, operation, and delivery. So looking at these institutions, we've identified around 30 characteristics of these alternative ways of working. Some of the institutions we found do a lot of them. Some of them just do a few, maybe even one. But there's one overarching characteristic that seems to be true for, for most, if not all of them, and that's that they embrace the student as a consumer wholeheartedly. So what I've done is, in terms of the rest of the things that they're doing, I've grouped the characteristics um, into four groups, and I wish I had more time to talk through them in detail, but I don't. Um, <laughs> characteristic group one is mission open. So this is things that um, institutions are doing to improve social mobility and make education accessible to those who might have extra barriers in the way to, to getting there, or looks like good stuff on the face of it. Group two, I've called practical access. They're also making themselves more accessible, but less through guiding mission and more through model changes that give students flex in time or cost or how to pay or how to access learning. Group three, place route to employment as top priority. And group four is a little bit more nebulous. Um, it's where the sort of changes to organizational structure are designed to maximize efficiencies and increase the impact that the institution's having on the students and the world around them. So I whipped through those, those slides and I know that you probably didn't see the detail, but there's good stuff happening, but this is the key. It's being delivered by largely profit-driven private providers. What do we think about that? Get in touch with me if you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, if she's denied you the fun. That was three seconds to spare. That was good. But the really good point, and I, 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 you know, I always encourage people when we are, we are doing the gossips, there is a seriousness here. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to give people a, sh a chance to have a shout out. If people have said something that's of interest, you want to come up, chat to them afterwards. As I said, it really is, it's, it's an opportunity because they're often, you know, they're going to be saying something interesting, apart from the next two. So that's, that's this is rare. Right, because, no, honestly, uh, no. Well, like Donna, yes, but, but Laurie, yeah, on so many levels. They actually asked, because there was two of them, could they have 10 minutes? Uh, sadly, no. That's a lie. Focal tools. Sultry sound of my voice. Oh, do you like that? Uh, no, I don't No, she's doing Bonnie Tyler song, sing along. No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so we start off on the left. We're going to start off on the right. We'll get increasingly close. Are these working? So by the time we get to B, then it'll be very complex. Yours will be absolutely air-chatteringly mental. Are we ready? Hands up in the air. Right. I'm watching. I'll stop it if I see some people who don't commit. I'm some, some down the back row with one hand. I'm watching you. Are we ready? We're just going to the right this time. A hane, a doe. Yeah. That's beautiful. Hang on, these two deserve your attention and your enthusiasm. Desperate. I'm talking about engagement. Yes. Desperate. Get the hands up, and I'm watching. Well, I'm watching this side. I can't see that side. <laughs> <laughs> this, this side doesn't do it. Okay. Are we ready? <laughs> a hane, a doe, a tree, a car, a kooik, gosta. So, what happens when senior leadership teams show their working? What might be the impact of radical open practice in management of a university? And what do we do if we do open management of pedagogy, of practice, of research, how we manage our universities? 
So we want to talk a little bit, or at least ask questions, about where does openness and transparency intersect with this sort of sanctity of managerial discretion. And I think about how often you or any of us have discussed or argued or just bemoaned our lot in academic life at the latest edict from on high. Some of those have been discussed here today. Um, how often have we been frustrated at yet another policy change? Uh, we've all heard our colleagues exclaim how they would not have made that decision, or uh, we've all seen why that policy is dumb. So we invite you today to imagine with us what radical open practice would mean in leadership in an institution. Let's talk about trust. Openness from leaders builds trust within the institution. Are you with me? You're with me. We're fostering a more cooperative and inclusive educational environment with openness. Too much transparency. That's the problem with trust. If we have too much transparency, that leads to information overload. And if we have too much of that going on, then we get misinformation. Then we get people not knowing what's actually going on. And that causes confusion and it causes indecision. I thought he was going to say confusion and delay. Um, in a crisis, open leadership can give us clarity and stability, yeah? We can guide the institution through these challenging periods with openness and transparency. No, we agree. No, seriously, we, we, we genuinely agree on this one. I want open and transparent leadership during a time of crisis because I want to know who to blame. I want to know who to hold accountable for what went wrong. That's just like you. Let's talk about innovation, new things, stimulating innovation by openly sharing, as we all are here today, ideas and processes. That's going to spark more innovation, like generating like. Others can contribute and refine. We don't have to think all by ourselves, as our good friend Nick said. We can think together and collectively, and that's good. That is good, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it really good? I want everybody to share their ideas because I want the vice chancellor and the president to know that it was my idea, okay? Share with me your good ideas and I will tell the vice president exactly how good it was and why I thought of it. Because okay. that's a great idea. Okay. Speaking of governance. Were we? Yes, I was. Okay. Okay. We're going to allow all staff to be valued in asking questions about decisions and processes. This is going to allow senior managers, who you invoked just recently, to more easily change their mind when they need to. They're going to pay attention to what people are saying. They're going to take seriously the priorities of the people who are talking to them, and they're going to change course where necessary. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Gerardo Solowan has just walked into the room, and he's got version 42 of the strategy that we've all had a piece of writing, and we've all agreed, and we're now going to take that to the Senate, and Senate are going to say, but also now we want some more changes, and we're going to see all those decisions out in the open. Because we all want to have a crack at it, right? We all want to have a crack at governance because we can all do it better. So if we share all of that governance out, what could possibly go wrong? How long could it take to get something through Senate? Evidence-based decision-making. Now think of it. Imagine, picture if you will, your leadership is open and transparent. We would see decisions based on evidence showing leadership by empirical processes and not based on intuition none of this i'm going with my gut bullshit right but this is what's the case and this is what needs to be the case and that's going to be the basis of our decisions and we're going to talk about it out loud so everyone knows why we do things everybody in the room i need you to know that evidence-based decision making is a marvelous thing and it works so well because I come from Brexit Island where we really paid attention to the evidence. Vote now, vote now. You can clap for me or you can clap for Donna. We're me. open, hey, open, go, hey, car, open, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
I say John Gale good is, is worried now. Well done. Brilliant. Great quest. That was a lovely, 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 lovely format. So, now, Alan, I hope you're taking pointers for tomorrow. So, we're now going to welcome to the stage Cathy S. Miller and Leo Haberman. Now, come on, get him. Oklahoma. That's about the only bit I know. Okay. So, some people, a little bit more physical now, if you, if you can manage it. We're going to go up on the hain, down on the doe, up on the tree, down on the car, up on the cooig, and then the arms out for Gosta. Have you got that? A little bit complicated, but yes, you have to stand up. I know. So, no, no, no. You, you, no, 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 wait, wait. No, I love your enthusiasm, but just curb your enthusiasm, okay? So, when I, when I go, when I shout out, go, we're going to go up on the hand, okay? Are we ready? A hand. A doe, a tree, a car, a cooey, Gosta. Hi, thank you for having us. Welcome to Beers with Leo and Kathy. Uh, and we just really, as long as no one's bleeding by the end, we're ahead of the game. That happened yesterday. Yes, it did happen yesterday. So first I'd like to give a shout out and a thank you to Rajiv for recognizing a librarian's role in Open uh, this morning. And we won't invite him to stand or anything, just in case he isn't here. But it, there you go. Thank you for including us in the fairy tale. Uh, and it highlights the fact that librarians actually have a very long history with dragons. Ready for the next slide. So uh, origin stories are important. Uh, they help us know where we came from, why we're here, and help us kind of guide our future trajectory so that you don't end up a giant Airedale chased into a grand piano by a chihuahua, which happened in real life. So this is kind of a metaphor, perhaps, for where we can end up if we are not intentional about identifying where we would believe we came from and what our current state is based on and where we hope to go. Um, and so how I got here, Kathy Esler from Oklahoma State University, I have a background in music education and uh, came to librarianship through educational technology and found out that what I'd been doing my whole life, sharing resources with other people because the arts are not funded, uh, actually had a name and it was OER. And then I started hearing this history about how it started in 2010. And I was like, well, I've been alive a lot longer than that, um, but wonderful. Uh, and then all these high points of, of when it came to be and then that its history was rooted in open source. So I thought all this is, it was very interesting. Um, but I knew that didn't really resonate with my experience. Uh, so that's how I got here. How librarians got here is based in a long history of bringing communities together to help generate knowledge and understanding. Uh, librarians trying to provide access, make sure people can get what they need to get to, make sure they can get to the spaces and the people they need to get to, and they've been doing that for freaking ever. Uh, and so that's going to matter here in a minute. Leo, do you want to share how you got here? That was a surprise for him because he said we couldn't write a script and so I didn't. So is this on? Oh, yeah, good. Um, how did I get here? Oh, I don't know. Um, I just got into it. <laughs> yeah, someone just handed him a grant. And I was here kind he of a learning technologist. And before that, I'd been a librarian. Right, there you go, and that's, that's why we're here together. Uh, so, but what I'd like to share is something uh, that Marco SV from uh, the University of Idaho uh, has shared, and I think it was Open Ed, well, I don't remember which one it was, 2020, but the reference slide has it, and I'm reading it so I don't mess it up. But he says, he pointed out, the conventional histories and scholarly contextualizations of open movements do not connect open pedagogy to liberatory women of color feminist praxis and scholarship on education. And he pointed to black feminist scholars, Bell Hooks and Regina Austin as intellectual foremothers. And I thought that was a really interesting take on the history of open. And I think kind of deciding where, where are you? What are you grabbing from which history? How does that factor into what you're doing? Uh, will kind of have an impact on us moving forward. Okay, next slide. Communities of practice, someone in here is an expert on it. Find them, share vocabulary. It matters, right, as you come together, what you're talking about. Okay, so, but I took too much time on the earlier slide, so we gotta go. Okay, so 2019, I don't know how many of y'all remember that. 
Yeah, so it was something, didn't have the guts to actually put up here what I wanted to put up here. But if you're curious, just Google open in 2019 uh, and maybe a hashtag and Twitter. And uh, I was still kind of new to this space, was interested to see what was happening and the pushback and how the pushback was being pushed back at was stunning to me. Uh, and I think the roots of that are in where librarians came from. And if you look at the timing of some of the things that have taken place, you'll see how big a role we played. Go. When Kathy asked me to co-gast, I tried to resist. Um, I thought it's a long time since I worked in the library, what do I know about it? Um, but it did seem like an opportunity to have a rant that I like to have, or at least a new version of it. Um, I saw a quote on Mastodon the other day, which was, without an analysis of power, it is hard to understand inequality or much else in modern capitalism. Um, this was from Nobel laureate economist Angus Deaton, who was slamming his profession as clueless. And I felt like this chimed with the message of my rant, which is that we cannot gain an understanding of education without an analysis of labor. Um, Rajiv mentioned the idea of the hero's journey this morning, and, um, and this idea of the educator who just comes to openness and does fantastic things um, is one that we often talk about, but we need to think about the labor, and this is also in the library. Thank you. Good, thank you. So we want to tell you that we did that on purpose because we wanted to model open as never finished. Oh, boom. Our last one is Bea Del Delos Arcos. I'm apologies for butchering that there. We're going to be really getting complicated now. Uh, one of the things I loved at the European soccer a few years ago was the Icelandic doing the clap. Do you remember the... You have to live with that, you know. Spatial, there's enough space there. You clap on the number, so it'd be hey. Wait, wait, wait. You want to build her up. I was trying to build up the, you know, the, the sense of momentum. Are we ready now? Thank you guys. Um, so I'm Bea de los Arcos. I work as a senior learning developer at the Extension School in Delft Technical University of Delft University of Technology. I always get it wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> we, well, I do many things. One of the things I do is MOOCs. So the Extension School, we make MOOCs. And um, I like to think that I am the guardian of open, in massive open online courses. Um, by default, our, our MOOCs get shared on the Creative Commons license. Um, but I struggled a lot in a way I keep struggling to make people understand not only the license itself, so what is a commercial or non-commercial share alike, blah, blah, blah. It's the concept of sharing, the implications of sharing, how do you prepare for sharing, what you share, what do you not share. Um, so I came, I said, let's, how can I make it easy? How can I make it so, so simple that they can't actually, they can't actually miss it? Um, so pretty much what I did is I opened a Flickr account and I just uploaded a couple of my photographs. And immediately I started uh, pestering, I mean inviting my colleagues to share the photographs and pretty much it was, oh, you went on holidays. Oh yes, look, that's my phone. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful photograph. Would you like to share it? I've got a lovely place for you to share it. It's a Flickr account. You will keep the copyright because of course it's your photograph. But uh, what I would like you to do is um, tell me what permissions you give others to reuse your photograph. So that was some three years ago. I continued to pester, the pestering just got inviting, got just bigger and bigger. Uh, so that's how we came to We Like Sharing. So We Like Sharing is a photo bank of um, photographs that are open, so they're all released with a Creative Commons license that the, um, each author chooses. So at the moment, we've got over, well over 1,200 1, photographs that have been um, contributed by 
more than 200 people. And remember, this is staff, students, alumni, friends, and families of. <laughs> Any connection you have with the table Delft is good enough to have your photograph on, on the repository. Uh, again, all released under a CC license, the author chooses the license, that's, that's the only request I say to people in order to kind of have their, their photograph in the repository. Um, the, every, description, every photograph comes with uh, pretty much with, with a little text that, that you can copy and paste, so attribution is never gonna be easier, right? And at the same time, they are all tagged because you know, I want these photographs to be reused. I want this this photograph to be uh, found by other people. And uh, one of the things that my guys, my course teams, always forget is about the alt description. So each photograph comes with a very little text, objectively describing what it is that. Um, that you can see in the photographs that then can be used. Again, copy and paste job is just, it cannot get more easy than that, or easier than that. The QR code will give, will send you, will bring you to, to be like sharing in the about. There is actually an email address if you, anyone wants you to contribute. Um, but one of the things that we do every year, and this is what's have, this has given me the most fun since GoGN. So, you know, it's just pretty close. Uh, and also, you know, kudos to Alan for, for helping me with the communication and the, the connection with OI Global. Uh, the first year, so when the repository only had like a handful of photographs in there, it was coming up to Open Education Week. And I said, well, why don't we make the we celebrate Open Education Week, and the way we're gonna celebrate it is by having a photo competition. And in that photo competition, I asked people, can you send a photograph in which you represent what openness means to you, right? So, you know, the award is just a little something, uh, but it's been so, so, so amazing. Uh, we've kept it for, <laughs> Four years now, just go and use the photographs. Check the photographs, use the photographs. They are beautiful, non-beautiful, but they're all open. Pain, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Do it, stop. Thank you. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, hello, yeah. Um, can I just ask the people just to stand up and turn around to the audience. Anybody can be a presenter, it takes a lot to be a gossip here. Can you just stand up and give them a round of applause?